We continue reading in John's Gospel. Russell read the final words of chapter 13. This is, this is all final discourse of Jesus, where Jesus has gathered in the upper room with his disciples and, and the final words and final teachings that Jesus has for his disciples. They have just had a meal together and Judas has just left. Jesus tells them a new commandment. And now in 14, verses 1 through 10, listen for God's word. I'm going to read through 14. John 14, 1 through 14. Jesus said, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my father's house, there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to Thomas, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to Philip, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, we thank you for the sharing of these final words, for the ways in which they are a seed and find a place in our own hearts and our hearing. We pray that you would find a home within us so that we might make you known. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. It struck me this week, as we finished our nearly year-long study of the Ten Commandments, that the final word, thou shalt not covet, which has always seemed like a period to me, now feels like it's looping us back around to the first word. In Dan's sermon last week, and in our Presbyterian Women's Circles during the week, I heard, do not live your lives wanting what is not yours, or simply in wanting and wanting and wanting. In God, there is enough. You have more than you need. Do not look at all this other stuff in your life, hoping that it's going to define you as what is right and good and worthy, because God does that. God is enough. So commandment number 10 brings me back around to commandment number one. There is only one God. And I thought, how clever, how very clever of God to make this list that we've turned into rules so much more than rules. They are a dynamic and living and moving guide for our lives. One leads back around 
to the first. So here we find ourselves today in our reading in John's Gospel, where we've been waiting since Easter, waiting, W-A-D-I-N-G, and Jesus throws at us an unexpected curve, another commandment, a new one, an 11th one. If you're keeping track of our John stories, you'll see that we are circling back around by reading John 13 and 14 to a pre-Easter story. In fact, this one is on the night of betrayal. Jesus has just washed his disciples' feet. Judas has taken the nudge to begin his own act of betrayal. And now Jesus turns to the remaining disciples to tell them what he's been telling them all along. He has to leave them. He's leaving them. Only this time it feels more imminent and more foreboding. And they're beginning to believe him, though they hardly understand what he's talking about. It would seem that these chapters 13 and 14 are completely disjointed from one another. They're usually read that way in our lectionary. They never meet. Chapter 13 is assigned to Maundy Thursday, Upper Room. Chapter 14 is assigned to our gatherings at funeral services. One is set in the grittiness and the messiness of life, and the other is set in this ethereal contemplation of life beyond. Scholar Jared Sloyan says that the true assessment for all of Gospel of John is this in-betweenness that these two chapters set us in of the grittiness and dirtiness of life and this ethereal view of the beyond. Reading John, Sloyan says, you feel as though you are on a borderland. On one side of the world is the remembered events and history, supper preparations, a Courtesy performed by Jesus, girt in a towel. Human dishonesty, failure of nerve. On the other side is the world beyond. The being with the Father of which the Son so eloquently speaks. In the world which the Gospel describes, no one has yet traveled there. Hemmed between the two, says Sloyan, the borderline of history on one side, the glory of the Father on the other, is this hinged existence, this life in between. And that's the life that John's community is living. Yet ever since Jesus' resurrection, it is the everlasting life. It is the life of the Christians now, a frustrating life combination of being and becoming, of following Jesus as a disciple, and not yet having faced the later on when they will come after him where he is. I notice that threading these two chapters are the responses of the disciples Peter and Thomas and Philip whose confusion at what Jesus is trying to teach them becomes more real to us than anything else. Often we make fun of and we're dismissive of the disciples' obtuse reactions to Jesus, but in truth, their reactions are our own. Wait, what did you say, Jesus? You're going where? Can we come with you? Why can't we come with you? These questions of location are threaded throughout this gospel. And they place Jesus squarely with us. John begins that way. He says, he came and he tented among us. He tabernacled among us to his ever-moving location and our frantic search for him. Where are you staying, Jesus? Where are you going? To the end, where have you put him? Perhaps that's why we rest in those 
peaceful words of Jesus, I will come again and I will take you to myself so that where I am, there you may be also. That's what we've been waiting for. Throughout this gospel, we've been waiting for those words. Yes, finally. Now, where is that Jesus? Now, lest we get too far ahead of ourselves, dreaming of mansions in the sky, Jesus sets the disciples and us squarely back in our earthly bodies. The presence of Jesus is here, even after the physical presence of Jesus is gone. And this is how. Through the command, love one another. Mutual love is the only key to the door of being united with Jesus and to demonstrate Jesus' ongoing presence in the world. We embody God to others through the way we practice love. One, four, three. We do not love based on another's worthiness for it. We love out of a response to what Jesus asks us to do. It is hard. As Garrison Keillor reflected in his blog this week, this is the news that transcends all other news. For Jesus, it is simply this. Love one another. We could all use a little refresher course in that. Start with Jesus' other followers because they're often the hardest to love. There's a familiar painting showing a pair of monks in heated discussion before clerical onlookers. Their faces are contorted, the veins in their necks are bulging, and their foreheads are straining. Its title is Odium Theologicum, a phrase that was given to describe the bitter hate and anger between those who discuss theological issues. Odium theologicum, the hate of God's defenders. Sloyan again says there's an ancient adage that says, O oh, liberty, what crimes have been committed in thy name? The same is true of love. Crime of passion makes the heart think of eros. In the long span of the church's life, the basic crime tends to be hatred of one another, the death of agape. Yet the church's one unequivocally true doctrine is this, love one another. Ministers of the gospel must preach it often, and live it always. Jesus says to the disciples, if you wonder where I am, it is in how you treat one another, how you love one another. Choose to follow me by practicing this love because that's where I'm going to show up. We don't have to do this perfectly, to do it meaningfully, of course. Indeed, even as we remember those who have loved us, we probably have to acknowledge that while their love was not perfect, it was nonetheless powerful. God is love. God sent Jesus to show us that we are loved and that this love changes us. And that this love empowers us to love others. And that even when we struggle to love, often for the most compelling reasons, God continues to love us and work through our lives to bless the world that God has created and continues to sustain. Craig Poor was um, reflecting on his life recently. And he gave me permission to tell you this. 
And he said, I used to think that my life's goal was to be the best salesman that I could be. And I threw a lot of energy into doing that, into going for awards, into competing with the best and the brightest, into looking for recognition, getting, achieving. But these days, I don't find any worth in that. I think life is really about being generous. I think I get more joy out of giving, not getting. I have thought all of all the people who sacrificed so that I could succeed and have a good life. My mother was the first among these. She sacrificed everything for me and she didn't have a lot. And at the end of her life, I would have given anything for her. Those are the people I admire. Those are the ones I want to be like. That's how I want to be with people. I began to ask myself, could I make people's lives better? I'd rather be generous and help change another person's life. And then he told me a story of their housekeeper in Singapore. Lorne and Craig and Thomas traveled to Singapore seven years ago for work. It is the practice of expats in Singapore to hire housekeepers who serve as cook and maid and child care givers to help foreign families to navigate this strange new country that they are living in. Many of the housekeepers are Filipino women who have left their own young families for years at a time to make a living and to send money back home. The Poors hired Rosalinda to help them with young Thomas and the household. Rosalinda had a young son and a daughter in the Philippines, a six-hour plane ride away. She would share a small room in their home and she would take on daily responsibilities. Knowing that housekeepers' jobs can be hard away from the family, often at the mercy of very cruel and fickle employers, Craig and Lauren worked hard to be equitable with Rosalinda. They navigated what became a good relationship, and at the end of their time in Singapore, the Poors included in their thanks to Rosalinda a customary leaving bonus but they wanted to do more. And in his note to her, Craig said, I am only here doing my job, taking care of my family, because you are here taking care of your family. They gave her a year's salary so that she could go home. And she did. And she was with her children and she and her husband started a business and expanded their home. Just a couple of weeks ago, Rosalinda's daughter, Kriza, emailed Craig. Kriza was starting in the universe, is to be starting in the University of Manila soon, and she writes this. Sir, I hear that your health is not good. I may not know you, but in the story of my mother, you are a very kind person. Thank you for being kind to my mother. I will pray for you, sir, and also for your family. Don't forget to pray, sir. God is always there for you. Because of Craig's generosity for her mother, he left a witness to the whole family. Martin Luther asks in his catechism, what does it mean to have a God? And he answers that God is what you hang your heart on. The heart that is troubled is not a heart hung upon God, 
but hung rather on all the things that the world peddles to soothe the troubled heart. Jesus tells the disciples in this time of deep uncertainty, hang your hearts on God, hang your hearts on me. And love, love one another. For it is in your loving that you will find me. Amen.